San Sebastian. That thing there is my last name. I live in California now, but um, it's actually really nice to be back in Europe where umlauts and accents are pretty normal occurrences. Um, sorry about my voice. I think I'm allergic to bad APIs, so that's why I'm like this. <laughs> so I work for Facebook now, the React team. Um, I'm not an evangelist. I just code stuff, I'm just some dude. Um, I also represent Facebook on TC39, the standards committee on ECMAScript. Um, but don't worry, the bad parts are not mine. There's someone else's. So I guess a lot of people here have a favorite library. Um, you there, what's your favorite library? Nothing? React, that's a good call. <laughs> uh, do you guys use like libraries for everything, like the same library, like a utility library, like underscore? How many people do you use underscore? It's cool. jQuery? Uh, something like Angular, high level? YUI? Ooh, sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, this is the great part about JavaScript, like the R community, right? If you look at platforms like iOS or Android or .NET that are proprietary, basically everyone just says, do whatever the platform owner tells you is the right thing to do, right? There's these stock secret black boxes that you can't touch anything in, and everyone tells you you can't do better than they did, which is not true, let's be honest. Um, that's not true in the JavaScript community, though. We have like this vibrant community of, of frameworks. We even have discussions and fights about how many package managers we even need to manage all of our libraries. I think a lot of them are called NPM, actually. But do we really need this many ways to iterate on an array? How many ways do we need to like access DOM attributes? Do you even know all the concepts in Angular? Do you know all the APIs in Ember data? I don't. Do you know how many ways there are to filter like an array in, in just an underscore? Is it the same in Lodash? I I think it's the same in Lodash, depending on which version you use and like, what you opt into. Um, do you even know all the APIs in the standard JavaScript library? What about ES6? So job recruiters and job descriptions are looking for this experience with specific libraries. And if you know the same concept under a different name, you're actually not good enough because like, you're not going to get ramped up quickly enough before the company pivots or whatever. right? It's starting to get a little bit annoying with all this proliferation. But of course, you have a solution for this. You created your own library, and now there's only one thing you have to learn. It's probably super easy. It solves all the edge cases, and all the names are super easy for you to understand. How streamlined. JavaScript these days is really hard to learn. Imagine this is like the first day, and you get dropped into a code base. Uh, complicated web app, and you're in the middle of the web app, it's your first day, you have no idea how things work. How many calls into JavaScript libraries do you see that you've never seen before? Now, imagine this is the life of like thousands of your colleagues. We had our own core libraries at Facebook as well. One of the most common questions we had was, so which Facebook-specific module corresponds to this underscore or jQuery function? It's not that the library itself is too big. Your library is pretty cool. And it doesn't matter if it's like too many bytes. There's this way to optimize and, and filter those things out. It's the, actually the total amount of APIs that you have to learn to be productive in this industry. That's really difficult these days. And I don't think this is inherent to a diverse ecosystem. So I don't think this is inherent to programming in general. And I think I found a process that can help us minimize this problem. First of all, listen to slow-moving standards organizations. Then write some spaghetti code. Never abstract until it actually causes bugs. And once it does cause a bug, add an abstraction, but remove as much surface area from the industry as you add to it. Now, this doesn't sound like best practices at all. And nobody wants to listen to slow moving standards works. But let me get back to that a little bit later. First, some history. Let's back to 2005, late 2005. It was an interesting era for the web. It was before Internet Explorer 7. 
JavaScript dependency in an update for like six years. ES4 was like being drafted and was kind of going to failure. Um, but minimal JavaScript with the library we had was just not enough, and the community had enough. And we started to take things into our own hands. And this was an era where all the libraries started to see proliferation. A lot of them were like prototype, base JS. They, those two heavily inspired Moo tools, which I, which I kind of worked on a little bit. A lot of those bad things were my fault. Um, but of course, libraries couldn't agree on a standard way of like extending prototypes and having this global namespace. So the best practice became to use things like jQuery and underscore because they had a, their own separate namespace. Then ES5 came along and it became popular to patch prototypes again, but this time it's called polyfills. And a lot of those polyfills naturally replaced prototype and, and mood tools because they were sharing the same namespace. But the libraries in their own namespace, like underscore and jQuery, lived on, and it was still the best practice. They actually had better APIs at the time because they were better documented and it was easier to learn because there was no standard that you can rely on. And the rationale that they still live on is because it's empowering to have an abstraction on top of the native features because you can tweak performance, uh, you can fix things in the specs that are a little bit annoying uh, without relying on a standards body to try to fix it for you. And even the TC39 the, for JavaScript would even argue that if you're not quite happy with this, you should just use your own standard library and, and build something on top of the standard. But which, which one do we use? There's at least two ways to do this now. There's the standard way, and then there's the library way, and there's multiple libraries. So we asked ourselves, because we got this question a lot, should we just adopt an API or a popular library, like underscore, or maybe a Lodash? But, but which one of them, and which version? And is this going to be maintained? Do we even control the source? Is it community driven, or is it controlled by one person? Um, do we require this library from all of our open source, or do we decouple it with some other dependency? So let's take a minute to look at why we actually use JavaScript to begin with. It's not the best language in the world. Whatever your favorite style is, there's at least one better language out there that will compile down to JavaScript. We can just use that instead, right? Well, we use JavaScript because it's ubiquitous. It's something that people could agree on. Um, this is why general purpose programming languages keep winning out against DSLs and custom languages. And by introducing divergence in the library community, we're actually undermining what JavaScript is great. So back at Facebook, we started building source, source transpilers for ES6 features. We, we invested a lot in ES6. We became very early adopters of the class syntax throughout our entire code base. We joined TC39 to start working on ES7. There are some problems with this technique, though. There's, there's some native functions that are actually slower than the re-implementation of them. Lodash shows this over and over again. That's pretty easy to solve, though. You just monkey patch it. Just override the native version with another version that's faster. Um, this is one of the strengths of JavaScript, that you can actually do this. Um, Sometimes, don't tell you anyone, but you can actually use shams as well that are not quite compatible just to get the extra performance boost. Just make sure that you can continuously try to follow the standards as it's moving along, and also try to not expose dependencies on non-standard behavior. Um, there's a lot of compatibility problems with just relying on polyfills, so. In the early days of the spec, the, the spec changes a lot. You basically have to live with it as a library rather than a final draft of a spec. You continuously upgrade. But you can really only have one version in one realm at a time. We have a lot of solutions to solve this. And there, another problem is that you might have to load like a huge polyfill on the initial page load instead of doing the modular loading. And all of this stuff is really difficult to get right. But we and a lot of other people are trying to build open source tooling to support your environment or your stack to actually enable you to do this. And this is all hard work, but it allows us to have a very simple story. At Facebook, we use JavaScript's standard library. There's one way to do things, and it's the standard way. And it avoids a very simple problem. It avoids 
bike shedding. And bike shedding is the biggest waste of time of all. We leave that to the standards mailing lists. And this reminds me of the least intuitive lessons that I've ever learned from a large organization. And it's actually the top-down authority is best used on very least important decisions, not the most important decisions. For example, I'd really recommend that you enforce a strict and comprehensive style guide, just because it avoids this discussion of, on every uh, pull request or every diff, which style you're going to use. And every new person isn't going to have to like fight to get their style. But you might be asking yourself, JavaScript standard library doesn't have all the features of my library. So what do I replace this with? Well, often the answer is just write some more boilerplate code. It'll take you a few seconds longer. You don't take on a dependency. The person coming to fix your code doesn't have to know about your obscure function and to 20 other versions with the same or different names that someone else thought was better and better looking. This can be really annoying to have all this repetitive code that looks ugly when we all want beautiful code, right? Except this process fundamentally has no end ever. We're simply never going to realize a state of software nirvana where everything is supremely satisfying. And that's an important emotional realization. This was an early quote from an uh, early Facebooker. Um, but to put it another way, you're not going to find a perfect library API. Your good looking code now will look bad in a year, and you or someone else will have to go upgrade it. You might not even remember what abstraction you found was what was cool today, right? However, it's not all gloomy. Um, often the answer is just write your code a little bit differently. You can learn new patterns that allows you to structure your code in a different way to achieve the same goal, but it's more precise even using just plain JavaScript functions. Now, learning these patterns is quite difficult, and it's definitely a learning curve, but that makes you a better programmer in general. Large frameworks, they usually have an API for every kind of use case, and you can just search for that API, like ask for it on Stack Overflow, and you can find a link to it. But when you learn patterns, you have to read a book or a tutorial or find different ways to express the same thing. It's, it's a different way to search for things, but um, essentially it's the same problem. It's just a slightly different solution. And if you structure your code in a way that uses patterns instead of black box libraries, it's much easier for the next person to read your code to actually understand what's going on. And this is the most important lesson I've learned at Facebook. It's much easier to recover from no abstraction than the wrong abstraction. So this kind of says that spaghetti code can be better than the structured code. And this is very counterintuitive to a lot of modern programmers, at least. It's that the structured abstraction adds overhead to whatever new coder needs to learn just to get up to speed with your code base. But you know, like one little abstraction can't hurt, but abstractions tend to spread because technology is just a level, layer of abstractions, one on top of the other, and everything you have on top of your abstraction will need to be unwound. So you have to unwind every layer with a total and complete understanding of the intricacies of that system to get back to the original layer and then rebuild from there. And that means that it can actually be more a lot easier to upgrade verbose, repetitive, and explicit code than it is to upgrade an abstraction. Now, I'm not saying like bad code, like spaghetti code is better. It's really like fettuccine code. <coughs> Have you ever lived with like a large app that was built on the wrong framework? And you tried to upgrade it, but you can never could because you could never understand this, how the, the underlying framework really worked. Or you had an existing app that was just written in haste. It was all spaghetti code. Maybe it was good spaghetti code. Maybe it was fettuccine code. A few abstractions, a lot of repetition. Which one was easier to upgrade? And which one actually left with you with more reusable code? Abstraction comes with a significant cost and a significant risk. 
So it's better to abstract to begin with. And once you have a nice Fettuccine code base, start finding repeated patterns. If the pattern doesn't lead to bugs, don't fix it. It might look ugly, but it's not hurting anyone. Try to generalize it, and you only risk adding bugs in the generalization. It only adds surface area to everyone. But once it starts causing bugs, then it becomes a problem. Because it's repetition and some algorithms can be difficult to get right, and then it starts causing bugs. Then you generalize. You create an abstraction. But make sure that this abstraction can be used for a wide variety of use cases, because it has to uh, make it worth its weight. It might even be subject for standardization if it's general enough. And this is where slow-moving standards org can actually help you. If it's general enough and useful enough, it will be accepted as a standard. Maybe it will be accepted as a draft, and you can sort of continue from that. Um, but if it's not, then maybe it's not actually worth the weight it's adding. Maybe you need to rethink or prove its value. Now let's talk about the DOM. There are apparently 25 methods to work with attributes alone. You can also access attributes through properties. That's still no reason to use jQuery. The browser inconsistencies could be polyfilled, and the rest is basically just adding some sugar. It's not solving the actual structural problem and complexities of managing a DOM and living DOM, and that thing is the thing that leads to bugs. Now, Angular and Ember, they try to address this by adding change tracking and data binding libraries on top of the DOM. Now you don't have to manage the DOM direct directly, and this actually solves bugs. This is a legitimate use case for abstraction. And in theory, web components and similar efforts can actually work on standardizing these patterns, and then there's one thing you have to learn, and it's this data binding web components world. Except they don't actually remove as much as they add. The surface area of these frameworks, these paradigms, is still huge. There's a lot of things you have to learn. Learning how to use web components in a fully structured way with all the data binding and the intricacies of that is still huge. And that continues to be the case even when it's standardized. But with this paradigm, it's all necessary. And that tends to happen when you keep building straight on top of existing ideas. So sometimes you just have to rethink the whole stack. Come up with a smaller surface area. So we thought mutation is actually the hard part of the DOM. So what if we could just throw away the DOM and recreate the whole document, like a page reload? So we invented a library called React. Now we're not trying to diverge from standards, like web components with this. We just think that the functional approach taken by React means that we can drop so much more of the surface area. And we're trying to, all we're trying to do is make it a lot easier for you to reason about code without having you to think about a lot of surface area. Because the remaining surface area is things that you can think, spend time thinking about around your domain-specific world. So this is the API of React. You expose a function that gets the initial state of a component, a render function that you can read from a state, and a callback that sets state. You'll notice that the set state is actually the only API into React in this room. And this is really the only API you have to understand in React. We also have this syntax sugar. It's basically because braces are a little bit difficult to read. It looks like templates, but it's not really templates. There's no repeaters. There's no special directives. There's no special conditionals. It's just plain old JavaScript. Now, React's internals are pretty complicated. The diffing algorithm on top of the DOM can be fairly complicated. But the surface area that you have to face as a developer to know and understand what's going on in React is very simple. There's no new APIs. It's just a simple concept. You can build an incredibly complex app like this. I mean, we did. And up until this point, it sounds pretty good, right? But nothing is free. So what are we giving up? Implicitness. React favors explicit APIs. And for you to write out your code as explicitly as possible, 
over built-in magic. For example, in many cases, we get requests for implicit bubbling of events because it's tedious to pass a callback around or some extra properties around. Well, it turns out this is a terrible idea. It's really difficult to follow code that depends on implicit bubbling of events because it means that if either side ever disappears, you don't know where it disappeared. Let's say one call disappears from your stack, and then later we realize that actually led to a bug that we didn't anticipate. How do you find that? Do you have to go through every component and the history of every component or abstraction along the way to find where that end happened? This is just one example. But it speaks to the idea that saving a little bit of typing is actually not a good reason enough for an abstraction. It's much easier to recover from an explicit API by adding some sugar than to undo an existing implicit API. And we take new abstractions in React very, very seriously. While you have to live with a little bit of extra boilerplate in certain cases, you know that you and your successor will probably understand and be able to refactor your code in the future much easier. Now we make mistakes too, of course. Um, if you use React, you might have noticed that that's not actually how you write React right now, because we built our own class abstraction. This was very tempting and convenient. We could add special helpfuls to it. But in the next version of React, we're deprecating that, and we're going all in on ES6 classes. It's not an extended version of ES6 classes, it's just ES6 classes. Now, because this is not a one-to-one -one mapping, it actually means a little bit more boilerplate in some cases. But it means that since we're removing proprietary features from the library, you can use whatever abstraction you want. Preferably, we just use standard JavaScript so we don't add extra weight to our industry. But if you really do want to use a third-party library, since we provide the standard class system, it means that you, we can accept any kind of third-party class system as well, because the standard represents an intermediate representation that can be shared across libraries. This causes the coupling as a side effect. Now think about that for a minute. React already has a small surface area, but we're actively removing proprietary features from the framework. Uh, just because you should mostly use your standard language, it doesn't mean you have to use all of it. So JavaScript already has a huge service area, and if we want to add, keep adding more stuff to it, then we have to remove something, because otherwise it will just keep growing and our industry will run out of headspace or whatever. But this is already being done through linters, strict mode, um, VMs only optimize certain patterns. So I, the next thing I want to work on is basically just formalizing this step of the process. How do we remove features from the existing language? I mean, they will never be removed from the web because you can't remove things from the web. But it can be removed from our industry's mental surface area. So let's put JS on a diet. Use polyfills instead of libraries write explicit and repetitive code, only abstract to actually solve bugs, not because it looks better, and then rethink the stack and purge, and then start over again. Thank you.